Let me get everything all set up. <laughs> Let's get everything, all the things queued up. Make sure everything is going all right here. Let's see. Okay. All right. We got everything going <laughs> slowly but surely making sure everything is streaming to everything. And we got the attendees coming in. This is great. All right. All right. All right. All right. And we have plenty of room for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> helpful. It's helpful. Yes, we have plenty of room for everybody. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, get started on my spiel so you right. and uh, Chris and Phil can, can kick it off and I can fade into the background. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Nat. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment to thank y'all for joining us for this RoverCon pop-up event. Um, since we can't meet in person for our annual weekend extravaganza in September, um, the RoverCon team has innovatively <laughs> shifted to a little workshop pop-up event focus where we can create these meetup spaces virtually um, because community and connection is really important, um, especially for us geeks. Um, so be sure to check out RoberCon and Roberson.org for more mini events in person and online. Uh, and Chris, I will hand it off to you now. All right, thanks, Nat. You're awesome. Um, all right, well, um, you know, it's, it's been uh, 25 years uh, since the Doctor Who television movie. Uh, starring Paul McGann, aired on Fox in the U.S. and the BBC in the U.K. Uh, it's fair to say that without the tenacity of producer Philip Siegel over its seven-year development period, uh, the film would never have been made. And who knows, maybe we wouldn't have had the revived Doctor Who that we have now. Um, so thank you for joining us, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Uh, I was a big fan of the film back in the day. I still am. And I got, I got a lot of questions. So I hope you're ready. Oh, no, it's, it's very kind of you. Thank you for having me. I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. So, so I, guess, I guess, you know, the, the, the place to start is always at the beginning. Where did you first encounter Doctor Who? I mean, I know you, you grew up in the UK. Is that right? So well, I was, I, I, where you first encountered it? I was born in, 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 the, in the UK. I oh. came to the US when I was 10. Hmm. Uh, but um, I'm one of those people who uh, my grandfather sat, he was a, a watchmaker and a jeweler. He lived on, we lived in Hendon, uh, just outside of London, London, he did, I should say. And uh, one afternoon, uh, he sat me on his knee and we turned on a black and white television and we watched uh, uh, An Earthly Child. Oh, and nice. uh, so that was the beginning of my uh absolute passion for this character and um i have seen all 760 of the original episodes <laughs> not many people can say that because many uh, of them are now mia uh, yeah there was a lot of kind people around the world uh believe it or not there was a broadcaster in pakistan who yeah. actually had some tapes mm. we got them from everywhere it was quite quite astounding interesting Interesting. Uh, well, you know, uh, you, you, Doctor Who's worldwide now, so and it always was. So, yeah. so getting getting from Pakistan is not not really a surprise. So, um, so so how you know what? Why did it make such a big impression on you when you first saw it? Even you know, in that black and white era of you know the the very small TV screens compared to what we have now. What what was it that really captured your attention? Well. You know, I've always been I've always been someone who was curious about the world around me uh, from a from a very very young child, and uh, it, interestingly enough, when Doctor Who was launched, it uh, I don't know if many people know this, it was actually launched as a, an educational program, mm -hmm. and it was designed uh, to actually teach young children about history. And so this uh, narrative that was created about this traveling, uh, this time traveler, was to essentially take us with him uh, to various worlds, and we would experience things um, from different times and, 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 um, and different places. And uh, that fascinated me from the very beginning. That along with the fact that in a weird sort of way, um, you know, I, I connected with this sort of grandfather figure. 
And uh, it was a great place for me to hang out. I mean, I, um, it wasn't that I was an only child. I, I, I did have a sister, or, but uh, uh, we never got along. So I might as well have been an only child. But uh, that was really the connection it made for me. And uh, it gave me uh, a, a foundation, a, a place to experience things that I often experienced in my own head. I was very much about fantasy and very much about daydreaming and, and role playing. So it really, it fit my psyche perfectly. Mm -hmm. And is that, is that sort of what got you attracted to be in the entertainment business was, was that sense of, of fantasy to try to bring some of those to life? Well, that's another, it's actually a very interesting story. Uh, my mother, uh, bless her heart, who's still alive, she, she turns 89 in next week, uh, is a, a voracious reader. To this day, she's a voracious reader. And uh, she turned me on to books very early on. And uh, one of, uh, you know, obviously, an eclectic sort of group of books. Early on, it was Jules Verne. Um, so I'm much more of a fantasy guy than I am a sci-fi guy. But, and then of course, uh, one day she handed me um, uh, Henri Cherrier's uh, Papillon. And I, I read that. And um, of course in 70, I think it was 74 when the, when the movie came out, uh, she took me to see this, this film. And uh, I connected the dots between the book and, and, and what was put on, on film. And I, I was hooked. I said, this is, this is amazing uh, that you could do this. I mean, I, I learned uh, about this incredible medium uh, and the ability to tell stories and reach this huge, broad audience at a very early age. And I was hooked. And I, I've never, ever uh, wanted to do anything else other than tell stories. Um, I was never sure what that uh, was going to, what, you know, how that was going to form itself very early on. But um, it, it became uh, clearer to me as, as time went on that uh, producing was definitely something uh, that, that, that fit me perfectly. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, take, take us back to, you know, the late 80s, uh, 1989 or so, uh, the original, uh, what we now call the classic Doctor Who, uh, was uh, not getting a lot of love from the BBC at the time, and uh, it was canceled in 1989, and, but, but that was around the time when you started having, having an interest in uh, figuring out how to, how to bring it back and give it some more funding and have a U.S., you know, broadcast and uh, t tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I wrote a book about it, as you may, may have known, you know, and yeah. so it, it's, it's sort of, um, uh, it was one of those things where I was at the time uh, working for um, Columbia Pictures Television and they were owned by Coca-Cola at the time. And uh, I had just left the agent training program at ICM and I'd been hired as a development executive at Columbia. And it was a very strange time because uh, cable was, was emerging. And uh, a lot of these studios that were still sort of in the, the old way of, of, of making shows and, and, and sort of selling uh, were not really ready for or expecting what was about to happen in the next 10 years. Uh, but when I arrived, we didn't have an awful lot of content. And I was looking at this from as an opportunity to say, you know what, I've got a bully pulpit now. I'm a legitimate, you know, executive here in the US. I can write to the BBC on, on real stationery. And, you know, those days we didn't have <laughs> emails and computers. And, you know, we had teletyping and all this nonsense. Um, and so I thought, why not, you know? Um, but I had no idea I was going to get <laughs> the, the coldest shoulder. I mean, they, uh, you know, they were very gracious and they would take phone calls from me and, and they would write me letters. But it became apparent that I was just getting this runaround because they didn't want to be rude, but they had no intention of ever making Doctor Who again. Mm -hmm. And what... And what was it that, that, that got you to persevere through those years of, you, uh, you know, chipping away at people and, you know, eventually finding a way to make it happen? 
Well, I, I had one of those, I, not so much anymore, but I had one of those really annoying personalities where I was a bit of a dog with a bone. You know, I wasn't going to, you know, for me, no always meant yes. And I didn't really, I wasn't really interested in, um, in anything else. And uh, if you, you know, if you're in the, in the entertainment business, especially in the U.S., uh, you have to have a very thick skin. Uh, because you get more no's than yeses, and um, sometimes it, it, it's really difficult. But um, I think it, it was just the fact that uh, I really believed that this was something that deserved to be uh, reestablished. Uh, it, it, it had burnt out because I think that the executives at the, uh, the BBC had burnt out on it. Uh, poor Jason, John Nathan Turner, uh, I think at, at that point was, was not, you know, he didn't have the resources to do anything really anyway. So I, I really believed, I mean, characters like this do not come along every day. And so I just continuously uh, pounded it and pounded it and pounded it. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I got nowhere for, for, for many years. Um, I, as you know, um, it was seven years for me to actually get a yes. Uh, but I never gave up and I never stopped. And, you know, and the, and the years would go on and the executives would change at the BBC and the regimes would change. And uh, I just reestablished with the next one and the next one and the next one. And, and that's sort of how it went. Mm -hmm. uh, you, met, you mentioned, I, I do highly recommend if you're, if you're interested in uh, the TV movie and this, interest, uh, this interesting time in, uh, in Doctor Who history, uh, Phil did a book with Gary Russell called Regeneration, uh, which you can, you can track down in various uh, websites and uh, you know, you're, wh wherever books are sold, as they used to say. It's still available. Uh, so. <laughs> it's still there, I know. That's I, don't, I don't want to play favorites and mention, mention any particular websites because they've given right, us right. no money. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's a great read. Um, one of the fascinating things for me reading through that book um, is uh, the, the very long list of British actors who were originally like, it seemed like you sat down and said, who are the British actors between 25 and 65? And who, who could we get to, to try to, to try to do this role? Right, well, uh, it certainly appears that way. And, and there's probably some truth to that. But the reality of it is, is, you know, um, th there were so many factors involved in this, you know, it's like, okay, if we were going to bring it back, what's the wow factor? I mean, why do I care if just, you know, uh, a, a trade actor is going to pop into this role? Um, they didn't uh, want that, you know, it had gone with the days where you could find someone like a, a Tom Baker and, uh, you know, pull them off of a, of a construction site and put <laughs> them in, you know, in television. Uh, they wanted a brand. They needed to market it. They needed a star. They wanted a star. They insisted on a star. And then, of course, you know, we had this, this sort of dual uh, uh, polarity, which was, well, is it going to be an American uh, or is it going to be a Brit? You know, how, how does that all play out? And, uh, and should it be an American or should it be a Brit? And how are we going to sort of tackle that? And then, uh, then there were the actors who, yes, you know, from the BBC perspective, they were movie stars here. They were never going to do television, which the BBC didn't understand because, as you may or may not know, in the UK, uh, quality actors don't look at the media. They look at the actual... IP itself, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's a great project, they want to be a part of it. They don't care if it's theater, TV, or movies. Well, in the U.S. at those times, you know, we had this completely dopey system where uh, agents would say, oh, no, it's beneath you, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Movie Star, to do a television show. You cannot do that. That's just, that's literally suggesting that your career is over. So it was a completely different philosophy. So now I've got to build this massive bridge between these, these two, you know, um, English speaking uh, countries whose cultural devices, you know, went from here to the Mars. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and so that's why there was a laundry list of people. And, and it, 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 it did seem at the time that we were sort of throwing muck against the wall, but that genuinely wasn't the intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, according to the book, you ended up auditioning, you know, uh, maybe two, two, three dozen 
actors. I mean, what, what, what made Paul McGann the right guy for the role, uh, as you saw it? Well, um, he, he did uh, a film called With Nail and I. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was haunted by the performance and just there was something about him um, and his energy and his, th there was a, there's a soul. If you ever have a chance to meet this man, he's a very thoughtful man. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, he, he plays down that intensity quite a bit, but inside he's incredibly curious mm -hmm. and very childlike, but he uh, has a vulnerability about him that just haunts you. And so, you know, it, it really was one of those magnificent things where as you start to really see other people fall apart or they're just not available or their schedule doesn't work or they don't really want to be typecast and on and on and on and on, you start to think, okay, well, where is the quality talent that can really A, pull this off and B, I think is going to be respected uh, by critics and executives alike. And so it, it, he really checked all the boxes. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, so um, I, 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 what's interesting to note is one of the names that's listed in the book, not that he auditioned, was Christopher Eccleston, was yeah. one of the names that, that you looked at. It's, it's interesting to look back at the list now to say, uh, you know, that, 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 that he, was, he, he was on the radar in some way, and there, there were certainly some other actors who were not as famous as they are now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, who were on the radar. Uh, I think uh, Anthony Head is one of them, for that's sure. Right. I mean, that was, that was pre-Buffy. Yeah. So, like, he wasn't really known at that point. It, it's just fascinating uh, to, to look through that list and, and see who actually auditioned, who was, who was you, know, uh, you know, sort of on the radar, at least, too. Well, yeah, and later on, I, mean, I, I don't want to jump, jump ahead for you. So if, if, if this is, if, if you've got, the, if you're going down this road, uh, forgive me, but I don't oh, want to, I don't want to hijack your, your interview. But um, when we got to, when I got to Amblin and I was running uh, Stevens Television Company, um, interestingly enough, uh, we were just about dangerously close to getting the rights. And uh, you know, the BBC had granted the, the movie rights to a company mm. and they were in the last uh, vestiges of their third option. And they had to uh, essentially have hired a director and have started pre-production mm. uh, in, in order to extend one last time. And so in a desperate attempt to do that, they reached out to Leonard Nimoy. Right, I remember that. Yeah. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, this this company uh, ran out of money and ultimately shut down. They had to give up because they weren't starting production, even though they kept claiming they were going to. And so, curiously enough, um, several months go by, and I get a call from Leonard Nimoy because he associates me with the fact that he was supposed to, he was being interviewed to direct uh, the, the, the feature. And mm. so he didn't understand that there had been a changing of the guard. So he just thought I was the person who sort of, he would call and say, well, you know, are we doing this or are we not doing it? <laughs> so I said, well, I, 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 I said, I don't know if you understand. And I explained it to him and he says, oh, I, I understand it. He said, well, we should meet anyway. And I said, I'm happy to. So he came over to my office at Amblin and we had uh, a lovely meeting. He was incredible. He was very interested in directing. And in fact, he actually wanted to throw his name in the ring to play the doctor. Mm. And so, uh, but as you can imagine, you know, this is 1995 at the time. And, um, you know, late, late 94, 95. And, it, it, it was very interesting, but there was this stigma attached to Star Trek at that moment in time uh, where it felt tired and yesterday and it, it wasn't, oh, that's a great idea. And so the network would never have approved it. So even if he w had wanted to, uh, to direct and or star in it, I don't think they would have approved it. 
That would have been that would have been interesting. I, I I imagine that was an awkward phone call when he calls was, and says, "Am I directing this or what?" And you're like, uh, "I know." And it was very strange. <laughs> it was just one of those very strange things. Well, you know, because bless bless their hearts at the time, the BBC were not very good at communicating to anybody about anything, and so uh, and they were in a little bit of disarray at that moment in time. Uh, but um, it was just it was it was very strange. Um, uh, I also. You know, I, I met with Michael Crawford, um, uh, Eric Idle. I mean, the, there was a huge list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, but Paul Paul McGann was the guy. And yes, he was. I, I think uh, history has certainly shown uh, that you made you made a very good choice. Thank you. Very good choice. <laughs> one of the, one of the things that that always intrigues me about the the television movie is that you know there there were there were several sort of script ideas uh, that were concepts that uh, before the one that we saw on screen, uh, there were ideas where uh, that would essentially have rebooted the whole show from, from the beginning and, and sent the doctor out to find his father and, uh, you know, all, all of that interesting stuff. Uh, where, where, where did those kind of radical ideas uh, come from and, and why did you end up not using them uh, in the film that we saw? Well, uh, in my defense, let me first say that, you know, if you go back to the 60s and you remember the Peter Cushing movies, there were two Doctor Who movies uh, that completely uh, blew up uh, the, um, you know, w w what, we, what we had known right. uh, about the Doctor. No nobody seemed to, to you know, there was, there, was, there was, I don't think anybody really sort of complained. They just don't. It's as if it doesn't exist in the timeline, which right. is fascinating. Mm -hmm. But there was also, um, uh, a, you know, along the way, things like, uh, well, where did the Daleks come from? And, you know, there were two origin stories for the Daleks. The first one is they, there was a planet of Thals and, and Dals, and um, right. the Dals, you know, became Daleks. Uh, and, and then, of course, later on, we got the Davros uh, uh, st uh, st origin story. So, um, you know, over the years, the truth is, is that the, the, the sort of the, the mythology of Doctor Who has been bolted onto um, in, in all different kinds of ways. Um, what I wanted to do was I, I wanted to, to, to do two things. I wanted to try and bring the fans along who loved this character in this world, while also trying to introduce a whole new generation of people uh, uh, to, to this world. And that was the challenge. And so when we set out to try and, and look at all of these things, we were trying to, 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 to literally weave something together that had a, a sort of 90s relatability but also uh, did not tread on or, or discard uh, the origins and mythologies that came before. So we, we kind of, we pounded, you know, a lot of these things over a lot of time. There were many, many months and months and months of meetings and discussions and, and conversations uh, that, that led to that John Leakley script that I assume you're, 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 you're referring to. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do want to say uh, a, a Doctor Who fan on Twitter when I was uh, telling folks to make sure to tune in tonight uh, called you a visionary for kickstarting the whole exploding canon vibe that has manifested in the new series as we've seen it now. So, you're, well, you're, uh, that's very kind. I'd rather be called that than a, a few other things I've been called in my life. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because, Hollywood for you, sir. That's because, Hollywood for you. Well, I, I can tell you, you know, um, interestingly enough, uh, at the time, uh, there were a couple of huge uh, Doctor Who, Who fan clubs, you know, and there was a, a convention here called Gallifrey One that was, uh, you know, uh, that I snuck into. Um, very early on, you know, sort of in, in about 93, 94, I snuck into a room of uh, probably, you know, 130, 140 people with, you know, a lot of the old cast. And they were talking about a new show and uh, my name came up on stage, you know, and they didn't know I was there. It was all very funny. Uh, but by the time um, we came around, uh, we and Gallifrey, 
you know, one was sort of booting up for the year that we were uh, coming along, it, that little room of 100 went to several thousand. Um, and so I tried to embrace that, obviously, as a way to promote uh, the fan base uh, for Fox uh, so that they would start to understand that this is legitimately uh, something that, that is not to be messed with, that there, there's a lot of loyal fans out there and they love their Doctor Who mm -hmm. and they should be embraced. And so um, I went out of my way to, to, to sort of uh, engage them, but um, I actually did a little round table with, with, with some of them. And when I'd mentioned uh, this idea of the Doctor Who being half human and he was gonna have, you know, perhaps even a, a romantic encounter for the first time. Oh, I got looks like you <laughs> thought I, I was, you know, destroying uh, something. Because it's very interesting how people relate to this character and, and, and how important it is for them to feel connected to him. And anything that perhaps rips that connection apart, they don't want, they don't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, why, why did you ultimately sort of, um, uh, end up going in, in the direction that we see on screen where, uh, you know, it, it, it fits a little easier with the, uh, you know, with the, with the classic series and is more of a continuation rather than, you know, a reboot. Well, I mean, you know, sadly, the reality of all of these things is, you know, there are several factors. Uh, one is you have to have a distributor or a network who's willing to go along with you. And, and second of all, you, you, you know, you, you have to have the money. And, uh, and so budget was a huge factor. You know, I originally had intended to have a a, a, a real sort of Doctor Who and the Daleks kind of send up. And um, I had designed all kinds of very cool Daleks and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a added sort of a new wave to Cyberman and all these different characters so that we could could really sort of immerse ourselves in the universe, but, but find them in this kind of uh, contextually kind of uh, different world uh, that perhaps was a little more progressed in terms of nuances and and look and um, emotional uh, content because a, a lot of the creatures and monsters that were in the original series for me were a little one-dimensional and uh, I think uh, to the defense of every writer and every actor that ever put on a mask the second you put on a mask, you've lost everything. You have no emotional context. Uh, and it's very, very difficult uh, to find ways to, to get around that. Um, and, the, the, you know, it's sort of uh, the universe has to come together in brilliant ways. I mean, obviously, it does happen. I mean, I think the Daleks prove it does on a certain level. And I think Darth Vader proved it, do it does on a, on, on a certain level. But having, having said all of that, uh, at the end of the day, uh, as you become sort of closer and closer to the reality of, of what you've got to spend and how you're going to spend it, uh, it, it starts to, you know, the reality sets in. And, and unfortunately, story does start to uh, be molded and shaped around cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I imagine uh, you, you talk some in the book about, you know, uh, juggling some of the requests from from the BBC and Fox and, and Universal and trying to, trying to you know, m m give, them, give them something that at least they could all mostly agree on, right? Yeah, no, that was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. I mean, we went everywhere from, well, uh, let, let's get rid of that blue police box because uh, he needs a different spaceship, you know, that, I, I go, okay, guys, hold, hold on here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, and, uh, a Fox executive said to me, well, that's a British uh, thing. You know, it's not even American. I said to him, actually, you're wrong. Uh, that police box was invented in New York City and, mm -hmm. and was actually, um, the idea was, was taken from the New York Constabulatory and uh, the British, uh, the Metropolitan Police uh, actually embraced it. Uh, so you're wrong there, I said. And go, oh, well, okay. Well, but, but, but why does it? I said, listen, I said, I don't think it should bother you what the exterior of his time machine looks like. Truly, I'm telling you, uh, it will be embraced by the universe. You will be loved for it. And it's about 
these characters in this story. I said, so let's focus on that and don't worry about the hardware. Let me worry about the hardware. And that was basically my, you know, my, my sort of attack on it. Um, now I did it with a lot of grace, poise and, you know, uh, sort of ple pleading, but I finally, I finally got most of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in, in terms of the hardware, I mean, I, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the very impressive console room oh. that, that was uh, part of the, I mean, that was part of the film. It was fabulous. I mean, it, 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 it looked, finally, it looked like, uh, like a real actual place where the doctor might live right. rather than just a white control room with a thing in the middle uh, and maybe a chair or two and maybe a hat rack. Uh, you know, do I, do I remember rightly that it cost something like a million dollars? Am I, am I misremembering that? No, no, it was $1.3 million. Wow, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Richard Hudolin, who was my production designer at the time, was a, he was a wonderful foil. I mean, he, he went along with everything. I, I, I gave him so much uh, from the old series to look at. And we talked about, you know, what it was that um, I was interested in, you know, so this um, um, Victoriana and a little steampunk to me, I felt would not date itself the way other things may. Um, and I was trying very hard to create something that, uh, you know, it felt timeless and yet, and yet it was in time. Um, but I also, you know, took a, drew an awful lot of inspiration from the Tom Baker years, and there was a lot of fun had there. There was uh, uh, an episode, I can't remember the series, so forgive me, I'm sure one of, one of the fans will, will remember what I'm talking about when uh, he's wandering around the TARDIS and, you know, um, and he uh, comes across um, a couple of rooms, you know, they were basically they were wardrobe rooms, mm -hmm. but he does enter what he called the old uh, TARDIS room. And mm -hmm. that to me was the light that went off for me and said, you know what, uh, there's, there's this really interesting kind of desire by these producers to, uh, uh, to, to really expand this universe. And I think they pushed it with all of that. And so I thought, well, let me take that idea and really run with it and, and let's blow it up and, 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 you know, use all of these things. Um, and, um, and, and so that's what we did. Uh, we, we tried, we tried to show you as much of the interior of the TARDIS as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. a, uh, as, as you predicted, a fan in the chat reminds us that it was Mask of Mandragora was that's the right. The mask, uh, exactly right. Wanders Thank you. The, wanders into the interesting oak paneled uh, control room, uh, which weirdly has a shaving mirror, like in the middle, yes. where, yes. where the, the 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 middle of the console should be. That's right. Um, that's right. I don't know whether he like shaved in there. Or no, I mean you know it's one of those classic things where you know whoever's building that week the sets is has been told. Oh, here's a, here's a drawing of this with, with the set. We need it by Thursday. You know, the poor man and, and woman, whoever it was who built that, you know, they probably had three days to do it and $10. And, <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, that's how it, that's how it is. Um, and especially uh, the, 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 the biggest thorn in the side of uh, producers on long running series, uh, especially the studio production executives, uh, rather than the producers, I should say, is building any set that you can't utilize next week. If mm -hmm. it's if it's a one-off set, you know, and and there, the story never goes back to it, you're going to have a really hard time getting it built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we 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 talked a little bit about what what it was like to work with Paul McGann, uh, you know, and sort of the thoughtfulness that that goes on inside his head uh, while he's performing. Um, what, what was it like to work with Eric Roberts? I'm, I'm always <laughs> intrigued by, you know, the, how, how Eric uh, Roberts ended up on the, in the movie and what was well, it like to work with him? Well, uh, uh, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna be very diplomatic here and, and hopefully, you know, um, I, I, you can read between the lines, but let, let me, let, let me end, let me start, actually, let me start answering your question at the end of it, which is, um, we found ourselves, uh, at a convention, um, many years later 
where he pulled me aside and actually apologized mm -hmm. uh, for his behavior because I don't think he really quite understood at the time. Uh, but, you know, er Eric um, was not without his demons and he came with all of them. And uh, he pushed me to the brink of, you know, looking for the tallest building I could to jump off of. Oh, no. in, 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 oh yeah. Uh, he did everything he could uh, to, to, to blow up uh, it, it all. And he, he, I will say, you know, he was an absolute gentleman about it much later and, and uh, cleaned up a lot of that insanity. But I, 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 I got him at the, the very height of it. Mm. He got he he seems to be in pretty much everything now, like you tune in like you know Lifetime movies you know yeah well I mean listen he's a working actor he, he wants to work he wants to earn a living you know yeah. and um, he didn't <clears throat> he didn't really shine the way his sister did mm -hmm. um, but he also you, you know he had his opportunities and I and I think as I said you know a lot of those opportunities uh, which could have propelled him gave him a reputation. And so uh, perhaps uh, a lot of uh, studios stayed away, uh, b which is a shame because I have to say this, he's an incredibly talented actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, what about uh, casting uh, Daphne Ashbrook and Yi Ji So as Grace and Chang Lee? Well, Daphne was just an absolute breath of fresh air. And I, you know, we've talked about, she and I had talked about this over the years, but I don't know if she really remembers how, you know, she showed up for the audition. And she really didn't know what she was auditioning for. <laughs> and, you know, and she was late and she couldn't find a place to park the car and she didn't know anybody's oh. name. And it was just, it was, a, it was complete, it was, it was pure unadulterated genius because, mm -hmm. She was just full of love and full of whimsy and, uh, but, but there was, you know, she was, she was a professional, uh, but she was just, you know, uh, out of it that day for whatever reason. And it was, it was just hilarious because what I saw in that moment was the moment she experiences the doctor for the first time, realizing that he is actually who he says he is, that there is something definitely wrong with this guy. He is not human and he may not be from this planet. And that's an awful lot to deal with. And so I really saw all of that potential in what was turned out to be an amazing uh, audition and this is one of the most fascinating things about actors and technique over the years is some of them with great success have deliberately come into a room and done things that were very very strange there are classic examples of it going back to i think it was a i want to say eliza minnelli or it could have been someone else so forgive me uh but there was a wonderful um audition in which uh, she sat down a, a, on a chair and she was snapping and chewing gum and uh, the director said would you mind removing the gum please for the audition so she took it out of her mouth and she stuck it under the chair <laughs> and she gave the greatest audition and left and of course after she left the room everybody's going well that is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life they went over to scrape the gum off of the bottom of the chair and of course there was none ah, you so you know it's it's those it's those it's those stories uh and i've had experiences with actors doing all kinds of things you know from um you know tripping and falling to uh putting on this air of, of being super angry and pissed off or uh, all kinds of things and you know it works for some and not for others but um, it, it is one of those great moments that I think a lot of talented actors don't realize. Uh, there is that moment where you go, aha, uh -huh, that's the rock. That's the, that's, you know, that is our grace. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that was, that was Daphne with Yiji, you know, uh, he was a young man who just really was intrigued with the idea of trying to be in the, uh, the television business. And he was a, a, a Canadian, you know, a young, young kid. Um, and uh, he fit the profile of obviously we needed an, an Asian um, 
to play the role, obviously. And uh, there were lots of lots of kids who came in and some wanted a tap dance for us and, you know, some wanted to give us a song and some wanted to do Shakespeare. But Yiji just didn't quite get it. <laughs> he didn't have, you know, so well spit and polish. He just didn't have any spit. <laughs> and, and and so um, I felt there was an honesty there, and because of the background of this character and where he came from, and and uh, what we tried to do with him, I really needed uh, that that sort of um, that youthfulness, but also that naive and that 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 sort of. Uh, lack of of understanding you know he hadn't had any acting lessons and he didn't really know what he was doing mm -hmm. and, and that it, it came across as uh, to me as very authentic and 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 so and so he he really you know i think earned earned a right to try we said well let's try so that was yg mm -hmm. now so so you have you have the cast together you're you're in vancouver filming uh, the film uh, you know what? What were some of the most challenging things to film uh, in the in the TV movie? Well, uh, first of all, you know uh, it was no fun being there in, in uh, February. Mm. You know, uh, it was cold and it was wet and it was raining and it was miserable and uh, not fun. Um, and so, you know, really, really hard when you're trying to to do things because. If you have to be outside and uh, now all of a sudden you've got to close the set in because you've got to tent it, you've got to figure out how to keep everybody dry and it just slows everything down. And it just is not fun. So weather was an issue for us. Um, uh, the only uh, other really big issue we, we, we had uh, was, uh, believe it or not, uh, we had a lot of fans who found out where the film was filming mm -hmm. and they got on planes and they came from all over the world i mean we had i would say without exaggeration maybe 50 or 60 people wow. and uh it it was really at, at one point i had to come over to them and uh and ask them to leave mm -hmm. um they were taking photos they were trying to you know they were trying to do all kinds of things and it, it just it became very, very disruptive. We, we, we were really um, challenged by it. Um, and it upset the local police department as well because um, traffic control and, and that, that sort of thing and safety and all of that, that, that thing, it became a, a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one, uh, I, I skipped over one, one actor who's in the TV movie that we should talk about is Sylvester McCoy. Now, now, how, how, how did he end up in the movie? And uh, is it true that the BBC originally wanted Tom Baker to be the old doctor? <laughs> no, it's not true they wanted Tom <laughs> Baker. Uh, what is true is they didn't want anybody. Oh. Uh, they didn't want Sylvester McCoy. Uh, the executives at the time didn't like Sylvester McCoy. Uh, and, and, and I, for, I did, you know, I went on an absolute rampage. I had to fly to London to actually get that sorted because um, I literally impaneled these executives in a room. And now you have to understand that uh, for the most part, there was a lot of frustration with the idea that I got this done and that Alan Yentob had, had said yes to me uh, because it diverted funds from people, all other things that people wanted to do and they felt it had lived its life and it, it was done and they weren't interested in, you know, in those days, uh, it wasn't about bringing things back. It was about what else we can do. And so this violated the sanctity of everything for them. <laughs> Um, uh, but I was on a different mission. And so uh, ultimately, to cut a long story short, we got it done. And uh, Sylvester took his rightful place as the doctor in the beginning of this film uh, so that we could regenerate him uh, as he deserved to, to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I imagine if you're uh, a, a, an executive at the BBC, you probably see Sylvester McCoy as you know, the last doctor who was there when the show was canceled. And you may not have good memories of, of that of that time. Well, there was a lot of that and the show had gotten very camp at the very end mm -hmm. and uh, the wardrobe 
became very camp and there was not a lot of love for the show uh, within the within the you know within the executive ranks and and um they uh i said you have to that this is not th this man is not responsible for that he came to work every day and he did his job and he did it wonderfully and um i just wish they had been in a different time in a different place because he was a great doctor and um i just think he um did not get a lot of the accolades that he actually deserved he he's a very talented actor and uh, i think he deserved better mm -hmm. well you, you you certainly convinced them to get him into the film which which uh was was uh, a, way, a way to show that uh, that kind of appreciation. So that was really cool. Oh, really thank good. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so looking back, are you, are you happy with how the film turned out? Do you have regrets that you wish you could go back and, and change some things or, or are you just kind of uh, good with it at this point? Well, it is what it is now, right? So, um, you know, it stands as a testament to, to what I tried to do. Um, regrets? No, I, you know, I mean, look, um, had we have had, uh, uh, more money, uh, I would have very much liked to have, uh, done a lot more with the Daleks than what we were able to do at the very beginning of this. Mm -hmm. I think the first act of this, of this film would have changed slightly and, uh, we would have had a lot more drama with the Daleks and a lot more of an understanding of what was going on. And, and um, I think it needed that, that element. Instead, we were completely earthbound. Mm -hmm. And, and th that is, is something that I do, I, you know, I do think about from time to time. time. But no, at the end of the day, you know, it sort of, it, it is what it is. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the TV movie was was really meant to be a, a backdoor pilot to a potential series, but uh, unfortunately, it didn't uh, materialize. But you know, if if your version of Doctor Who had been picked up for a series, what do you what do you think that would have looked like? Well, it didn't get picked up, but let me say, you know, they aired us the night that on Roseanne show, you know, John Goodman gets a heart attack. Right. And, uh, but I will also say that, you know, with a nine share, I challenge anyone to find a television show on Fox today with a, a, a point, you know, point nine to a one five is a hit. And I had a nine share. So anyway. Um, and, it, and it also did very well on the BBC as well. I mean, it had you know, I, I forget the exact number, you probably know, but I mean, it had millions of people tuning in. Oh, it was huge. The BBC. No, um, it was, it, it was huge. Know. And in fact, I, I got a plaque from TV Guide um, for uh, selling uh, the most TV guides in the history of the TV Guide. Really? Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. That's yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really so cool. it, it was it was really terrific. But, you know, and then there was, you know, sci-fi and, and everything else. But, uh, you know, um, Interestingly enough, on my uh, YouTube channel, Sprueverse, <laughs> where I build scale models. So any of you out there, please come and like and subscribe. Come and join me on, on YouTube. It's uh, yeah. Sprueverse.com. Uh, I actually built a Dalek. Uh, I built two. I built Davros and I actually built it. And I, and I spent about 40 minutes and, uh, asking, answering questions and talking about that. And in fact, on one of my episodes, I actually... Uh, pull out the old Bible, the original Bible that I had from uh, mm. when I worked for Spielberg and, and went and I go through it. So it's, it's on my channel and you can check it out um, because they're all there. The Daleks, the Cybermen, the Yeti, you know, um, the sea monsters. I mean, we would have, I would have di dived into those 760 episodes and I would have found a way to, to challenge the doctor to a lot of those uh, wonderful cat, you know, wonderful. They, they, they were great thematics and they had great ideas. Sometimes the execution was challenging, but the reality of it is, is there was so much to mine there um, and so much more to explore within those own, uh, within its mythology itself that sometimes it's not about reinventing the wheel. Sometimes it's about how do we take something and, and expand it uh, the way a good book you know, unfolds uh, from chapter to chapter. And I was really interested in, in, in that approach. Mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, if, you, if you find a, a copy of uh, Phil's book, uh, Regeneration, 
there are some great, great illustrations of some of the ideas that were uh, being kicked around if it had gone to a series, including uh, the spider Daleks, which I've always found to be a really cool, they kind of grow legs and, and you know, they can, they can walk around and, you know, maybe, uh, may, maybe they wouldn't be as worried about stairs. Uh, as right. Well, as that as was as that well. was a bit that was a big part of it. It was also <laughs> uh, it was also about the idea that 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 exterior that exoskeleton was really uh, a, the sort of the shell uh, of the alien that was inside it, um, and, and and so um, we really liked the idea of creating that that sort of arachnid kind of feel to give it the ability to hang upside down, to uh, crawl or disappear, you know, in the, in the John Leakley script, the, there's a wonderful scene at the top of the film uh, where we find a uh, Doctor Who in a cave. And um, he's, uh, he, he's sort of exploring this cave and he's aware that something is there, but he's not quite sure. And in the shadows, he sees one of these things move on, on the ceiling. And of course, the next thing, uh, there's a reveal, and there are literally thousands of these cocoon Daleks waiting to attack the earth uh, in this caves, in these caves. And it was, an, it, it was really well written. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also in there are, uh, you know, the, the version of the Cybermen, uh, the, the Cybes, right? That's correct. Uh, that, um, what, what's interesting to note uh, in hindsight is the way that they sort of had half Half of their faces you can see underneath the mask, and that that idea uh, has been used several times in the in the new series, mm. uh, especially in uh, the last series, uh, series twelve. Mm. There is there is a Cyberman character who essentially is you know a half faced uh, Cyberman character. So right, right. it's interesting that you know some of those some of those same ideas uh, you know, go go around and, and make their way on screen eventually. I'm sure. Well, I, I, I'm, you know, if they did come from us, I'm flattered and I'm thrilled. <laughs> right, absolutely. Well, you know, but, but that's the whole thing is you don't know, did they, did they hear about it from, you know, uh, the TV movie era or was it an idea they came up with themselves or, or you know, whatever. But it, it, it is interesting that eventually uh, most of these great ideas do make it on the, on the screen eventually. Well, right. you know, the, the, the challenge with Doctor Who always is, um, you know, when you, you think about trying to bring new creatures in, into his world, um, I think one of the dangers uh, of, doing, of doing that is, is not fully realizing the why. You know, I always asked and challenged writers, uh, no matter what I was doing, you know, even when, when I did Sequest in later years, you know, why, why? Because if we don't understand why, then I think we're just bolting things together and it, it comes across as, as very fake. And, you know, the audience, the fans especially, uh, who um, they're, they are very, very, very smart. They're very keen, they're very passionate and they want to engage. And I think that you have to be very careful not to, to you know, to for, not to forget that um, and, and be, be smart about it. I always refer to it as the physics uh, pass. If it, if it doesn't pass the physics of the world that you want to, to be in, then it shouldn't be, you, you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. well, well, speaking of, of the new show, I mean, when, when the new show came back, 2005, you know, some of the elements from the TV movie sort of uh, have, have transferred over from uh, in, into the new show. I mean, including obviously faster paced storytelling, having a much larger console room uh, for the doctor to play around in, you know, and, and, and having the doctor seem most, more emotionally connected to the companions, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is something that, that you didn't really see a whole lot uh, in the classic series. Uh, in the same way that we see it now. So it's, it's very yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that was obviously, it was, you know, it was BBC Wales that were um, given the, the brief to, to sort of bring Doctor, Doctor Who back. And they actually approached me to produce the original, the, 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 that's that series. Hmm. Uh, but I was at a time in my life where I wasn't going back to the UK to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, but I, I, I thought they had done a fantastic job. What I did, what I was uh, 
I did suggest and I was sad about is the fact that they didn't use Paul McGann, at least for the initial series. Uh, they, that they, they, they could have easily done and should have done, and he would have gladly done it. Right, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, although, uh, you know, are, are you happy that Paul has been able to build on the role, you know, at, in Big Finish Productions uh, audios and, you know, was, was on the back of the screen for at least a few minutes uh, for the, uh, the, the 50th anniversary. I mean, uh, he, he certainly has, you know, and Big Finish have built a character, uh, you know, way beyond, I'm sure, the expectations uh, of, of the TV movie at the time. Right? No, absolutely. And, and, and um, I'm thrilled for him. You know, he's a working actor. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, the reality is, is you know, um, he, he, uh, he spent a lot of time thinking about whether or not he wanted to be the, you know, doctor. When we asked him to be the doctor, he didn't come out immediately and say yes. Um, and so when we finally got him there and, and, you know, and he had brought his family, his wife, his kids at the time and really invested himself and sort of accepted the fact that he was going to be this iconic character, it's hard to come down off of that, you know? And, and so uh, I was happy to see uh, that, uh, that there was at least a reach out to try and, and, and work with him and, and, and uh, continue his involvement. And it's wonderful how the fans have embraced him and accepted him as the eighth doctor within the, the universe. Um, and, and that to me, uh, I was very grateful for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, question uh, from someone watching on Facebook. Uh, who, was, who was your favorite doctor growing up, having seen all of the uh, original series? Uh, who was your favorite? I was Tom Baker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Tom Baker. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I had a wonderful friendship with John Perch where he, we became very good friends and uh, he was an absolute delight. Um, but uh, for me, uh, what, what Tom did was he made the character uh, its own. And I think really um, uh, took it beyond uh, where it, where it had been uh, previous, uh, previous to him. I mean, I think he really showed us that this character could really reach great heights. And um, so for me, uh, it, it was Tom. Mm -hmm. So, so switching, switching gears a little bit, I mean, uh, over, over the last 20 years, you've, you've produced a bunch of reality TV shows. Uh, if you want to know more about Phil, uh, roguemediausa.com is the place to go uh, to see. Uh, there's a page that has all of these uh, amazing uh, reality shows uh, that, that, that you were involved with, including Storage Wars, Black Gold, Axemen, Ice Rogue Truckers. I mean, I could keep going on and on. Lots of shows. How many, you know, we, we were talking a little bit about this before uh, we went live. How many hours of TV have you, have you done? Uh, 4,000, about 4,800. That's amazing. That's and, uh, but, you know, and I, I had a, a, quite a, a good run in scripted before that as well with Sequest and Earth 2. And uh, I was involved with uh, ER. Um, I helped develop ER. And um, when I was at ABC, I did Twin Peaks. I did the, 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 the original series, Twin Peaks, and, um, and Young Writers and 30-something. So I, I, I had done a lot of scripted before I... I moved over to to reality TV, but you know uh, that that's where I, I lived um, and then sort of became the CEO of this company, and uh, we sold it to uh, Fremantle, and I I got to uh, fly off into the sunset, as they say. Nice, nice. I mean, uh, I imagine the challenges of reality TV are different than than with scripted TV, right? Very much so. Uh, it's a completely different muscle, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's it's a, it's a totally different world. And um, I wasn't interested, you know, I was more interested in sort of the documentary style kinds of uh, shows. Um, and I was not interested in, 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 you know, some of the other uh, 
types of reality that have, that have spawned. Uh, and those are shows I just simply would never have done, mm -hmm. uh, nor, nor do. And that's not taking anything away from the, the good, the talented people who make those shows, but that just wasn't my taste. Uh, but I, I was just, I found the knack for it because it was very much like documentary filmmaking. And I think if you, if you had a great story to tell, um, it, it, it was not, it was not difficult for me uh, to, to, to sort of find that way to tell that story. The great thing about it was it was very rough and tumble. Um, you know, uh, continuity was thrown out the window. Uh, it didn't matter if the, you know, camera walked into frame and it didn't matter if, uh, you know, if uh, it, it, it buzzed, you know, you buzzed someone and, and it went out of focus. So it, it had a lot of, at the time, it had a lot of kind of uh, in, uh, organic kind of, a, a, a sort of a natural high for me because like, this is great this is so freeing you know and we could get it on the air so fast um so there were a lot of you know boxes it ticked for me but uh i, I did burn out on it <laughs> right 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 I, I mean what one of the things we 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 talked briefly about before we went live was uh you know you you're, you're really fascinated by the idea of you know average people doing these uh extraordinary jobs uh, you know, like being a lobster man or, you know, being an ice road trucker. I mean, th th those are those are the kind of things that uh, people like me are never going to experience. Right. Uh, well, do it vicariously it, through the show. Know, ice road truckers is an incredible story. I mean, uh, that goes back to the 50s when um, they were mining for Raytheon up there uh, in the Northwest Territories. And... Uh, they could not uh, find anyone, uh, you know, they were flying uh, equipment up. They realized they could, they, at a certain time, the, this the equipment was too big. So they, they had to find uh, a, another way to do it. And uh, there was actually a, a mounted policeman who had just come off a case where he almost lost his hand to frostbite chasing a serial killer, found himself in a bar in Yellowknife. I kid you not, it's a true story. And these, you know, men in black sort of came into the, uh, uh, into the bar and they knew about him um, and, and, and said, uh, we, we, we've got a job for you. He said, could you get a truck from here uh, up to the Northwest Territories, you know, to the, to the old, to the mines? Um, uh, you know, on, on these, on these lakes. Um, and he said, it, 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 it's not impossible. He didn't say no, but he didn't say yes, but a convoy of them agreed to do it. You know, about six or seven trucks left, only three survived. The rest went through the ice. Wow. And, and so, you know, I mean, uh, at one point we were going to, we were talking to Fox about doing a feature film about that, that, that story, because it is an incredible story. You imagine, you know, you hear this stuff as a producer and then you go up and actually see these roads. You go, this is a world the audience has never seen. This is a place I'd like to take a camera and, 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 and share with you. So for that, uh, that, that was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they're, they're almost uh, stories and settings that, are, are better than fiction. That's in, right. In ways. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, when we went looking for uh, Alaska, you know, when we were in Alaska, uh, interesting enough for Deadliest Catch, uh, that, that show actually started out on National Geographic and we were sent up to, to Alaska to actually look for, for strange or interesting things. And uh, we were actually filming with these two uh, gentlemen in their 70s, the Dinkle brothers, who grew the largest vegetables in the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they had carrots that were, I kid you not, they were five feet long and weighed 300 pounds. And, um, uh, you know, but we realized, okay, well, that's a moment. That's not a series. But uh, one of the brothers uh, said to us, have you ever been to uh, the Aleutian Islands? I was embarrassed to say, I didn't even know what the Aleutian Islands were. <laughs> I, I didn't know where they were. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so we jumped on a plane and went down to Unalaska, uh, Dutch Harbor, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, we found the crab fishing fleet. I mean, oh my God, you know, this is like, uh, literally, this is like finding the Holy Grail. So, but in those days, uh, the networks gave you money uh, to go and just explore. They weren't afraid to do it. Today, all that's gone. There's no risk anymore. The, they're, they're, they're all risk adverse.
Mm. Yeah, they're not they're they're not willing to send you to the end of the world to try to find yeah. uh, a cool story. They're like, we want to know what it is now. That's right. It's now. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, a question, quick question from uh, from Facebook. Uh, would you ever consider writing a story for Paul McGann for Big Finish? I would. Yeah, I would. Um, I've never been asked, but I would. Well, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll we'll, we'll clip out this answer. We'll, we'll, <laughs> mail it, we'll mail it right to uh, Nicholas Briggs, uh, and uh, and we'll see what we can do. Okay, you've got a deal. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll write a recommendation letter myself. <laughs> okay, well, well I hope I change, pass muster. I want change.org petition. <laughs> Do those work? I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I, we, we, uh, just one more, uh, one more quick thing. Uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about your, your, one of your latest projects, uh, uh, Spruverse.com, uh, where you show off your serious modeling hobby. And I wanted to ask a little bit more about how, how you got into that hobby and, uh, and uh, what, what your goals are for this website. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very much. It, it is, it's, it's Spruverse, S-P-R-U-V-E-R-S-E on, on, uh, on YouTube. And I've been a closet modeler for 40 years. You know, I just, it was one of those things that you never really talked about in social circles when I was a 30 year old, you know. It was like, oh, I built plastic models in a garage. You know, it's like, no, no, no. You either went and played golf or you hiked or skydive. You know, you, you don't build models, but I built models. Um, and I have since I was a young kid and um, uh, I came back to the hobby quite seriously uh, about 10 years ago and I haven't looked back but um, there's one gentleman his name is Lou Dalmaso he's the Aztec dummy on uh, YouTube he's he's one of the most talented modelers I've ever met and had the privilege of now becoming friends with um, and it was him who really gave me the inspiration to uh, to start my channel because, you know, this is a man who worked for the government for, for 20 years. He's sort of semi-retired and he figured out a way how to make money while he builds models, uh, you know, in which is, that's what he does now for, for a living. And uh, I thought, well, that it was uh, immensely uh, interesting to me uh, because as an, I, I consider myself, yes, a writer and uh, an, an artist. I love to oil paint. Uh, but to be able to build models uh, for me was just an absolute joy and delight. And any chance I get to, to sit down in my um, in, in my hobby shop and build, uh, that, that that's what I'll do. And so um, it it was something that I, I wanted to do. And for uh, the reason ultimately is because I'd like to be uh, I would like to be considered an influencer. Um, I, I'm very passionate. I, I love every aspect of uh, of this hobby, and um, you know, and 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 I'm not short of a word or two, and so I'm I'm passionate, and so in my you know now in the the third chapter of my life, uh, that that's something that that I very much want want to do. Mm -hmm. You 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 mentioned earlier that you you have done a, a Gallic and a Davros uh, model, um, and. You, you, you said on the website that uh, your taste seemed to uh, lean toward, you know, the sci-fi uh, aspect of things. Are, are there things in particular that you really love to build that you have to track down and, and you know, put together uh, uh, as a model? Well, I'm, I'm building all kinds of things. I mean, um, I built a one-to-one -one scale Millennium Falcon, um, and I, I, I love that. Um, I built some, you know, some... I the interstellar ranger is up there uh but i'm also building a wooden model ship the hms victory in 184th scale uh that i'm also building along with a spitfire a supermarine spitfire which is an all wood construction with a um, actual aluminum skin um so uh, I, I'm sort of all over the map, and I do a lot of resin builds as well. There's a lot of talented resin uh, model makers and creators out there, like Randy Cooper, who, you know, spent many, many years in the business building models for movies. Uh, and, and of course, um, 
you know, uh, my very dear friend, Randy Newbert over at Voodoo Effects, who also does lighting kits for models, uh, a talented model maker, but an effects specialist. Uh, a lot of guys in the, in, who are building models now and, and working in the hobby uh, spend a lot of time in the movie business. So, um, but for me personally, yes, I, I do gravitate towards science fiction and fantasy vehicles, especially uh, just, just because it's where my, where my fascination is. Mm -hmm. Did you did you find that it was a good way to uh, keep sane during the pandemic? Oh, it was, uh, it was fantastic. <laughs> oh, it was absolutely fantastic. You know, when someone says to you, okay, you're quarantined, you can't go anywhere, um, and you have to just stay put. I go, really? That's yeah. fantastic. You know, I mean, I looked, at, I looked at my stash. I have about 1,500 kits, you know, in my, in my collection. Mm -hmm. And I go... There is a God. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was an absolute heartbreaker to know and see what was happening on the outside. Uh, and uh, my heart goes out to anybody who lost anybody to this horrible, horrible virus. And, um, but uh, I, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we're, we're slowly seeing a light at the end of the uh, tunnel. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, before we go, I just wanted to... Uh, make sure you knew that somebody uh, in the chat room, uh, Irene actually, uh, says uh, um, great, great Harryhausen uh, shirt. Uh, Thank you, it's, it's, the 100th, yeah. it's the 100th anniversary of Ray. And um, yeah, obviously one of the great animators and uh, model builders. Uh, and uh, w without Ray, we wouldn't have had stop uh, animation and uh, the genius of, of uh, King Kong. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was an appropriate uh, to, to, to celebrate him. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't, you can't see it. I showed it to you, but I have yeah. a, I have a <laughs> Grand, uh, Eighth Doctor shirt on. That's uh, awesome. Over on this side. So I love it. I uh, love it. Yeah. So I, I, I couldn't resist pulling that out of the drawer. But then I, I saw myself in the box and I'm like, nobody's going to see it. <laughs> so now, now people have seen it, uh, you know. Um, thank you again. Uh, great, great chat. I really appreciate uh, what you've done for uh, Doctor Who uh, and for still being willing to uh, take these kinds of questions 25 years later uh, after, the, after the airing of, of the TV movie. Uh, again, uh, spruverse.com is where you can uh, see Phil's modeling adventures. And uh, lots of great advice there if you're, if you're uh, into the modeling hobby. And uh, again, I recommend tra track down uh, the book Regeneration. Uh, great, great book that really chronicles the, uh, the making of the TV movie from the inside. Uh, nobody, nobody was more involved from the beginning than Mr. Uh, Phil Siegel. So uh, definitely, definitely a book worth checking out. Uh, if, if, if you love to read about uh, behind the scenes of Doctor Who and how everything gets made. Well, thank okay. you. You're very kind. Very good. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to try to get this up on uh, YouTube uh, in the next day or two, so I'll, I'll let you know when that happens. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, it was a great pleasure, Chris. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, be good. Be safe. Stay healthy. And uh, maybe we'll see you in, a, in person in a real convention sometime. Well, that would be lovely. I look forward to it. All right, we, we're, we're all looking forward to it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, take care.